I am Bob Rawson, honored to be the interim dean of the Case Western Reserve School of Law and in that capacity to welcome everybody to this. It's a great privilege to welcome you to this year's Frank J. Battisti Memorial Lecture. The Battisti Lecture, as we Clevelanders would, would know well, honors the memory of Judge Frank Battisti, who served for more than 30 years on the U.S. District Court here and for met many of those years as, as the chief judge. He was a great friend of our law school who hired quite a few of our, our graduates as clerks. Indeed, the lecture series came about because of the generosity and the inspiration and the devotion of many of Judge Battisti's clerks who helped to endow the series. I know there are a number of clerks in attendance, and I wonder if you would please stand so we can recognize you and thank you for your role in, in doing all this. We have had an extraordinary array of distinguished lecturers who have delivered the Battisti Lecture, some from the law and others from fields in which Judge Battisti had an abiding interest. Previous lectures have included such prominent judges as Leon Higginbotham and Jack Weinstein, legal historian Michael Klarman, historian of education Diane Ravitch, and one of Judge Battisti's clerks, Frank Wu, who is currently Dean of the University of California's Hastings College of Law, to name just a few of the lecturers who have preceded us. This year's Battisti lecture is Julian Bond, an active participant in movements for civil rights, economic justice, and peace, and an aggressive spokesman for the underserved of all populations. He is a graduate of the Morehouse College, where he received his degree in English, and there, while there, he took a leading role in demonstrations that resulted in the desegregation of Atlanta's movie theaters, lunch counters, and parks. He was one of the founders of the Student Nonviolating Coordinating Committee, which focused particularly, as many will remember, on voting rights. In that connection, Mr. Bond was twice elected to a seat in the Georgia legislature and was twice excluded because of his opposition at the time to the Vietnam War. It took a 1966 Supreme Court decision, Bond versus Floyd, for him to take his seat. He then served for 20 years in the legislature. In 1968, he led Georgia's loyalist delegation to the Democratic National Convention. That delegation was an insurgent group that had ousted the uh, hereditary regulars from, from their seats. His name, as many will remember, was placed in nomination for Vice President of the United States, the first African American to be considered for a national ticket by a major political party. But he had to withdraw because he was ineligible under the terms of the Constitution because he was under 35 years of age. Mr. Bond was president of the Atlanta NAACP for more than a decade and served four terms on the board of the National NAACP before chairing the organization for a dozen years. He has taught at the University of Pennsylvania, Drexel University, Harvard University, and Williams College, and now teaches at the University of Virginia. He holds honorary degrees from 20 colleges and universities. At the conclusion of Mr. Bond's remarks, we'll have an opportunity for questions. Because this program is being webcast, and recorded for future access on the internet. We ask you if you have a question to come to the microphones up front so you can be recorded, your question can be recorded. At the conclusion of the entire program, we invite everybody to join us for a reception in the area out, just outside the auditorium. Without further ado, it's now my great pleasure to present uh, a wonderful man, been to Cleveland once or twice before, which will probably explain to you for good reasons, who will speak on the subject of undercolor of the law. Julian Bond. Thank you. Thank you a great deal for that very kind introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your warm, warm welcome. It is a great, great pleasure for me to be in Cleveland once again. I've been here many, many times. In fact, I was surprised to see as I walked in, I've been in this room before. Uh, two years ago when the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was having a celebration of Sam Cooke, as they are this weekend having one of Fats Domino and, and Dave Bartholomew, 
one of the programs was in this room, and I remember either being in the audience here or on the stage here, and I'm glad to be back. I also like Cleveland because uh, it's many, many attractions. Uh, most of, most personally for me, the, uh, well, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I have relatives here who most of you will meet sooner or later if you don't, whether you want to or not. <laughs> Some of you know the Boyd family in the funeral home business. Those are relatives of mine. And they're, you know, you know they're the last people to put you down. So you may meet them. For a non-lawyer like me, it's always an honor to appear before law students, before lawyers and others in the legal field, as long as it's not in a courtroom. My first appearance before a judge was in a courtroom when I was 20 years old. It was March 1960, during the Jim Crow era. I'd led a group of my fellow students to the segregated cafeteria in the basement of Atlanta City Hall. We passed along the steam tables, loading our trays, and as first in line, I approached the cashier. Like most, most Southerners, she was polite. As she told me, I'm awfully sorry, this is for City Hall employees only. But I said, you have a large sign out that says, that says, City Hall cafeteria, the public is welcome. We don't mean it, she said. <laughs> and she called the police who came and locked us up. Because nearly 200 of us had been arrested that day in various locations around Atlanta, it was decided to try one person for each group, and I was chosen to be tried for mine. For the first time in my life, I stood before a judge. On either side of me were two men I had never seen before or met before. I quickly understood they were my lawyers. After some back and forth, the judge asked me, how do you plead? And I was panic stricken. On the one hand, I knew he thought I was guilty. The policeman had asked me to leave this establishment and I had refused. But I didn't feel guilty. I knew I had a right to eat in that tax supported cafeteria and any law that said I couldn't was no law at all. So I desperately looked to my left where the elder of my two lawyers were standing. He was the dean of black lawyers in Georgia. He'd risk life and limb for nearly 50 years representing black people in courthouses and small towns where he dare not spend the night. And now nearly in his dotage, he was asleep on his feet. I turned frantically to the lawyer on my right who said in a whisper, a stage whisper, not guilty you fool. And I had the presence of mind to drop those last words, or perhaps I wouldn't be standing here now. Now, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but my wife, Pamela Horowitz, seated there, is, and she's allowed to tell, for me to tell you that one of her judicial heroes and mine, Judge Frank M. Johnson, dismissed within hours of its filing the first lawsuit she ever filed, declaring the complaint to be verbose, prolix, and argumentative. The dismissal was without prejudice, allowing her to refile and eventually to win the case, the first of many she would argue before Judge Johnson. Johnson, as you may know, was a profile in judicial courage. He was a Republican from the free state of Winston, a northern Alabama county that voted to secede from Alabama when Alabama seceded from the Union. He spent 24 years as a federal district judge in Montgomery. As a member of a three-judge court, he ended the Montgomery bus boycott by ruling bus segregation unconstitutional. This would be followed by ruling striking down segregation and discrimination in every facet of, our, of Alabama life, schools, parks, jury selection, higher education, voting, and legislative reapportionment. He placed at Alabama's prison system, highway patrol, property tax assessment program, mental health agency, and public education system all under the federal court's jurisdiction. But he was far from alone in his judicial heroism, as Claude Sitton, who served as Southern correspondent for the New York Times in the early 1960s, put it, those people who think Martin Luther King desegregated the South don't know Albert Tuttle and the record of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Fifth Circuit, to which Johnson would eventually be elevated, then encompassed six states of the old Confederacy, including T Chief Tuttle's and my own Georgia. After the landmark Brown decision struck down school desegregation segregation, and with it the doctrine of separate but equal, Mississippi Senator James O. Eastman told a cheering audience in Senatobia, on May 17, 1954, 
the Constitution of the United States was destroyed because the Supreme Court disregarded the law and decided that integration are right. You are not required, Senator Eastland said, to obey any court which passes out such a ruling. In fact, you're obligated to defy it. It was in this atmosphere that the Fifth Circuit would be called upon to turn Brown's promise into reality and to expand it beyond the schoolhouse. Its judges would strike down barriers to equality in voting, jury selection, employment, in the process formulating the remedy of affirmative action, the just spoils of a righteous war. At great personal sacrifice, these judges took the nation and the, now, and the, nation and the South from white robe clan violence to black robe justice and helped save us from ourselves. But they didn't always get it right. In 1966, I was the plaintiff in a case that grew from my first election to the Georgia House of Representatives. A federal lawsuit had reapportioned the Georgia General Assembly, reconstituting a legislature where cows and horses were better represented than human beings. Having created new equal districts in urban Fulton County, the courts had ordered elections for a one-year term. As successful candidates for one of these new seats, I was to take the oath of office on January 10, 1966. A week earlier, Samuel Young, Jr., a Tuskegee Institute and a colleague in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was shot and killed while trying to use the segregated bathroom at a Tuskegee service station. Sammy needed to use the bathroom more often than most because during his Navy service, including the Cuban blockade, he had lost a kidney. The irony of his losing his life because of an illness suffered in service to his country prompted SNCC to issue an anti-war statement. We became the first organization to link the prosecution of the Vietnam War with the persecution of blacks at home. We issued a statement which accused the United States of deception in its claims of concern for the freedom of colored people in such countries as the Dominican Republic, the Congo, South Africa, Rhodesia, and in the United States itself. We said, the United States is no respecter of persons or laws when such persons or laws run counter to its needs and desires. Well, the statement created a, a sensation. I was SNCC's communications director, and when I appeared to take the oath of office, hostility from white legislators was nearly absolute. They prevented me from taking the oath, they declared my seat vacant, and they ordered another election to fill that vacancy. I won that election, and I was expelled again. By the time I approached a third election, this time for a regular two-year term, I had filed suit in federal court. Judge Griffin Bell, later to become attorney general in the Carter administration, wrote the majority decision for the three-judge court, which refused to overturn the legislature's decision to deny me the seat to which I had been twice elected. Judge Tuttle dissented. His view was adopted by a unanimous, unanimous United States Supreme Court, and a year after my first attempt, I became a member of the Georgia House of Representatives. Before the three-judge court, I was represented by Charles Morgan, Jr., then of the Southern Regional Office of the American Civil Liberties Union, and later my wife's partner, and by Howard Moore, later my sister's partner-in-law and partner in life. For the appeal to the United States Supreme Court, I secured the services of Howard Moore, Victor Rabinowitz, and Leonard Boudin. I'd never been to the Supreme Court before, and as I sat and listened to Georgia's Attorney General Arthur Bolton argue in his hypnotic Southern drawl that Georgia had a right to refuse to seat me, I found myself unconsciously nodding in agreement. <laughs> Victor Rabinowitz elbowed me and whispered, stop that, you fool. <laughs> Not the first time I'd been so addressed by my lawyer. <laughs> but during General Bolton's argument, Justice Byron White asked him, is that all you have? You come all this way and that's all you have? I elbowed Rabinowitz, I said, we're winning, aren't we? And indeed we were, and indeed we did. Chief Justice Earl Warren's unanimous opinion in Bond v. Floyd was more than a victory for the First Amendment, is a reaffirmation of my constituents' right to free choice in casting their votes. Unfortunately, the right to vote and to have your vote honestly counted is still not secure. Since the 1965 Voting Rights Act made black Southerners voters and made the Republican Party the White People's Party, the Grand Old Party has had a grand old time using scheme after scheme and election after election to keep black voters from the polls. Blacks were 24% of the delegates at the 2008 Democratic Convention in Denver. In St. Paul, blacks were 1.5% of the Republican delegates, the lowest total in 40 years. 90% of blacks voted Democrat in last week's elections. That's why voter suppression aimed at black voters plagues every election. Last week, 
In Maryland's gubernatorial contest, for example, robocalls went out on election night urging voters in two heavily Democratic, predominantly African-American areas not to vote. An anonymous woman's voice told would-be voters the Democratic candidates had been successful, adding, our goals have been met. We're okay. Relax. The only thing you need to do is to watch it on TV tonight. In 2008, the Justice Department filed a brief urging the Supreme Court to uphold an Indiana voter identification law, and the court did, even though the opinion stated partisan considerations may have played a significant role in enacting the law, and even though there had not been a single case of voter impersonation in the history of the state of Indiana. So we face an ever-growing list of state laws enacted in the name of non-existent fraud, but actually designed to restrict voting rights, all of which disproportionately affect would-be voters. The truth is that Jim Crow may be dead, but racism is alive and well. That's the central fact of life for every non-white American, including the President of the United States. It eclipses income, position, and education. Race trumps them all. We may have elected Barack Hussein Obama President of the United States, but Barry Jabbar Sykes cannot get a job, even though he has a degree from Morehouse College. He now continues his job search as Barry J. Sykes and hopes that hiding his race will open a space in the job market. The unemployment rate for black male college graduates 25 and older in 2009 was nearly twice that of white male college graduates, 8.4% compared to 4.4%. For black women with college degrees, the unemployment rate was 7% versus a 4% rate for comparable white women. Yet we're now asked to believe that affirmative action is no longer necessary, or worse, that it is somehow unconstitutional. The former is a big lie, the latter is bigotry. As Dr. King noted in 1963, it's impossible to create a formula for the future, which does not take into account that our society has been doing something special against the Negro for hundreds of years. How then can he be absorbed into the mainstream of American life if we do not do something special for him in order to equip him for, to compete on a just and equal basis? Affirmative action is under attack today, not because it's failed, but because it's been successful. It helped create the sizable middle class that constitutes one third of all black Americans today. Without it, both white collars and blue collars around black necks would shrink with a huge depressive effect on black income, employment, home ownership, and education. Whether race is a burden or a benefit is all the same to the race neutral theorists. That is what they mean when they speak of being colorblind. They are colorblind, all right, blind to the consequences of being the wrong color in America today. Some argue that affirmative action carries a stigma which attaches to all blacks as if we never suffered any stigma in the years before the words affirmative action were ever uttered. Why isn't this same argument made about the millions of whites who got into college as a legacy because dad was an alumnus, or he got a good job because dad was president of the company, or president of the United States? You never see these people walking around with their heads held low, moaning that everybody in the executive washroom is whispering about how they got their job. Nobody suggests that white women, affirmative action's biggest beneficiaries, are suffering any crisis of confidence. Since the nation was founded, all our elite professions have been the special preserve of white men, and they remain so today. I seriously doubt if a single one of these men is suffering low self-esteem because he knows, everybody knows, his race and his gender help him win his position. In 2003, the Supreme Court, for the first time, held that student body diversity is a compelling state interest that can justify the use of race in university admissions. The court gave legal sanction to what we knew to be morally, socially, and educationally correct. In dissent, Justice Clarence Thomas, affirmative action's poster child, opined, <laughs> opined that every time the government makes race relevant to the provisions of burdens or benefits, it demeans us all. He began his dissent in the Michigan case by invoking Frederick Douglass, for the proposition that black people do not need the government's interference and want to be alone. Justice Thomas ought to recall that Frederick Douglass also said this, if the American people could build a schoolhouse in every valley, a church on every hilltop, and supply them with a teacher and preacher respectively and welcome the descendants of former slaves to all the moral and intellectual benefits of the one and the other, without money and without price, such a sacrifice would not compensate their children for the terrible wrong done their fathers and mothers by their enslavement and enforced degradation. I believe Frederick Douglass would approve of the descendants of slaves taking their rightful place at the University of Michigan and elsewhere. Affirmative action represents racial redress and restitution. 
Let's not forget that winning in the Michigan cases was considered losing in the Bakke case when it was decided more than 30 years ago. What really happened in the Michigan case is that we avoided disaster. Disaster was averted again in a case last year involving a test for promotions in the New Haven, Connecticut Fire Department. The United States Supreme Court in a five to four decision set a new standard for Title VII enforcement and then did not give New Haven a chance to meet it. This will ensure the department's senior ranks remain disproportionately white. This, as Justice Ginsburg noted in dissent, in a profession in which the legacy of racial discrimination cast an especially long shadow and in a specific department which has increased its minority representation only through litigation and induced efforts. By undermining a standard the court itself created almost 30 years ago, the five-member majority needlessly muddled employment discrimination law and most assuredly weakened its enforcement. These five justices con continue to refuse to recognize the difference between race as a restriction and race as a remedy. The case, called Ricky versus DiStefano, illustrates the most pernicious myth about affirmative action. That is, black beneficiaries are taking jobs and school placements away from more deserving others. The truth is there are not enough black people in America to pose such a threat, except to those seeking justification for their own failures. Look at it this way. It's the fourth quarter of a football game between the black team and the white team. The white team is ahead 140 to three. The white team owns the ball, the uniforms, the field, the goalpost, and the referees. They have two minutes left to play. All of a sudden, the white quarterback, who feels guilty about things that happened before he entered the game, turns to the black team and says, say, fellas, can't we just play fair? But here, playing fair is a farce. It means freezing the status quo in place. Permanently fixing inequality is part of the American scene. It is part of a concerted effort to dismantle the legacy of the movement for civil rights. The right wing, now ascendant in American politics, aimed to repeal not only the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but all the progressive achievements of our lifetimes. The new health care bill, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the right to join labor unions, the Department of Education, the Environmental Protection Agency, the minimum wage, and unemployment insurance. In a questionnaire for a Tea Party group, Steve Stivers, who defeated incumbent Mary Jo Kilroy in District 18 here in Ohio, said, you could eliminate the departments of agriculture, education, interior, housing and urban development, transportation, energy, and others to return to a constitutionally pure government. The notion that the Constitution does not authorize many things that the federal government does today was incorporated into the Republicans' pledge to America, more accurately, a plague on America which requires Congress to show the constitutional basis for any new legislation. We can't know with certainty, of course, the outcome of any cases which will come before the Supreme Court, but we know the unanimity of cases such as Brown v. Board of Education and my own Bond v. Floyd is largely a thing of the past. Critical cases today are more likely to be five to four, reflecting the ideological and partisan divide that separates not only the court, but the nation itself. During the Reagan years, one of the true believers working in the White House wrote memos containing racist and sexist jokes. But his approach to the law was no joke. It has been written that he marshaled a crusader zeal in his efforts to roll back the civil rights gains of the 1960s and the 1970s, everything from voting rights to women's rights. Today, of course, that crusader is John Roberts, and he is the chief judge of the United States Supreme Court, where he continues his crusade against what he has called this sordid business, this divvying us up by race. The Roberts Court, in a cruel irony, observed the 50th anniversary of the Little Rock school crisis by gutting Brown v. Board, the historic case that gave birth to Little Rock and was supposed to end school segregation. Black and Hispanic school children today are more separate from white children than when Martin Luther King was killed, the result of a systemic neglect of civil rights policy for decades, including fair housing laws. School resegregation also means the average black and Latino student is now in a school where 60% of their classmates are poor, we also know the Roberts Court has given a new meaning to the term judicial activism, as illustrated in January of this year in Citizens United, the five to four decision that removed restrictions on election spending by corporations just in time for the midterms. As the 90 page dissent pointed out, the court was ruling on a question not presented by the parties. So they changed the case to give themselves an opportunity to change the law. Justice Stevens concluded his dissent by saying, while American democracy is imperfect, Few outside the majority of this court could have thought its flaws included a dearth of corporate money in politics. Lawyers, as Charles Hamilton Houston used to say, can be social engineers or parasites on society. 
Houston, who devised the litigation strategy of the NAACP against state-sanctioned segregation, and who taught Thurgood Marshall how to practice law, said a lawyer has five obligations. To be prepared to anticipate, guide, and interpret group achievement. To be the mouthpiece of the weak and the sentinel guarding against wrong. To ensure that the course of change is orderly with a minimum of human loss and suffering. To use the law as an instrument available to the minority to achieve its place in the community and the nation and to engage in a carefully planned program of arousing and strengthening the local will to struggle. The NAACP retained Houston as special counsel in 1934. He was one of a small group of black lawyers who came of age during the New Deal years. They and the NAACP shared a mutual dependency and a mutual admiration. As the president of the National Bar Association observed in 1939, we're cognizant of the fact that lawyers constituting the National Bar Association are essential to the success of the NAACP. We're also cognizant of the fact that the NAACP is essential to the success of these lawyers. Although Houston and Marshall, his protege and successor, are synonymous with the NAACP's litigation success, the organization pursued an innovative litiga litigation strategy from its inception in 1909. An early board chairman had been president of the American Bar Association. All but one member of its earliest legal committee were white, recruited from the er upper rungs of the New York City Bar. But it would be Houston's vision that would not only lead the NAACP to its greatest legal victories, but would also have a deep and lasting impact on how we think today about public interest law. A lawyer's job, a judge's job, doing justice is often a struggle. As Frederick Douglass wisely warned, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, it never will. And doing justice often means taking power from those who have it and giving it to those who do not. Nowhere is public trust more important than in the justice system. And nowhere, perhaps, is it more difficult to attain. Trust in pr public and private institutions has been on the decline in this country for decades, and courts are not immune. Nor are courts immune from the problems of the larger society in which they function. Wealth-based disparities, political favoritism, unfair treatment of racial and ethnic minorities. Last Tuesday, all three Iowa Supreme Court justices who voted in favor of same-sex marriage were removed from the bench in retention elections, pilloried on television ads and ignoring traditional values and the will of the voters. I agree with former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor that judges should be appointed and not elected. Justice O'Connor supported just such an initiative in Nevada last week for which she was blasted by conservatives. It lost by convincing 58 to 42 percent. Minority rights should never be subjected to majority opinion. All freedom movements, whether on behalf of blacks, gays, Latinos, women, are never-ending fights between right and wrong, often waged in the courts. American slavery was a human horror of staggering dimensions, a true crime against humanity. The profits it produced endowed great fortunes and enriched generations, and its dreadful legacy still embraces us all today. As the late historian John Hope Franklin wrote, all whites benefited from American slavery. All blacks had no rights they could claim as their own. All whites, including the vast majority who owned no slaves, were not only encouraged but authorized to exercise dominion over all slaves, thereby adding to the system of control. Even poor whites, Dr. Franklin wrote, benefited from the legal advantage they enjoyed over all blacks, as well as from the psychological advantage of having a group beneath them. Most living Americans, he said, do have a connection with slavery. They've inherited the preferential advantage if they're white and the loathsome disadvantage if they're black, and these positions are virtually as alive today as they were in the 19th century. 246 years of slavery were followed by 100 years of state-sanctioned white supremacy, reinforced by 100 years of discrimination and segregation. Thus, it has only been a short 45 years or so that all black Americans have exercised the full rights of citizens only 45 years since legal segregation was ended nationwide, only 45 years since the right to register and vote was universally guaranteed, and only 45 years <clears throat> since the protections of the law and constitution were officially extended to everyone. The country seemed proud, and rightly so, that in 2008, a candidate campaigning in cities where he could not have stayed in a hotel 40 years earlier won his nation's highest office. Less than two years later, the newly elected senator for Kentucky suggested the law allowing Obama to stay and eat wherever he wanted was wrongly enacted. Such is the complex rhythm of our nation's racial dance. Recently, I visited Berea College in Kentucky, 
opened by abolitionists as an integrated school in 1855. It was closed by the Civil War, but opened again in 1866 with 187 students, 96 blacks and 91 whites. It dared provide a rare commodity in the former slave states, an education that was open to all, to blacks, to white, to women and men. One of those early students was my grandfather, born a slave, who at age 15, barely able to read and write, hitched his tuition, a steer, to a rope and walked 100 miles across Kentucky to enter Berea. He belonged to a transcendent generation of black Americans, born in slavery, freed by the Civil War, determined to make their way as free women and men. From Berea, he studied for the ministry, married, had six children, one of them my grandfather, my father rather, Horace Mann Bond. My father graduated from Pennsylvania's Lincoln University and received a doctorate in education from the University of Chicago. For him too, education was a means to a larger end, the uplift of his people and the salvation of his race. He was asked to contribute to the NAACP's brief in Board v. Board of Education. He pursued this task with the optimism expressed by his father <clears throat> many years before. When my grandfather graduated from Berea, the college asked him to deliver the commencement address. He said then, the pessimist from his corner looks out on the world of wickedness and sin, and blinded by all that is good or hopeful in the progress of the human race, bewails the present state of affairs and predicts woeful things for the future. In every cloud he beholds a destructive storm, in every flash of lightning an omen of evil, and in every shadow that falls across his path a lurking foe. He forgets that the clouds also bring life and hope, that the lightning purifies the atmosphere, that shadow and darkness prepare for sunshine and growth, and that hardships and adversity nerve the race as the individual for greater efforts and grander victories. Greater efforts, grander victories, that was the promise made by the generation born in slavery more than a century and a half ago. That was the promise made by the generation that brought democracy to America's darkest corners four decades ago. And that is the promise we must all seek to honor today. Thank you. Thank you, and now as you've heard, we're going to have the all important question and answer period. And uh, before that period begins, I hope you won't mind since we're here in this academic setting, if I set some academic limits as to which kinds of questions will be tolerable and which kinds won't. Now this is not an attempt to dodge any tough questions because I believe like the teachers here that I can answer any question on any subject at any time, but <laughs> there are some questions that just won't do and those are questions asked by people who do not want to ask a question, but who want to make a speech. <laughs> Only one speech scheduled for the auditorium tonight, and it's over. <laughs> you can tell these people because they usually begin there by saying, isn't it true that? Or doesn't everybody know that? Or isn't it a well-known fact that? Or don't the best authorities agree? Well, if everybody knows it, if it's a well-known fact, if the best authorities agree, why bring it up here? <laughs> are there any questions? And please use the microphone on the side of the room. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Leslie Huff, and I'm a lawyer who practices here in Cleveland. I want to thank you for your long, long-standing work uh, in behalf of all people, uh, my African-American family, my LGBT family, and uh, the legal um, family, and democracy. Having, a, having said that, I wanted to ask you uh, if you felt any, um, if, if you have reflected upon your um, avoidance of uh, um, Mrs. King's funeral in light of the new scandal that relates to uh, Bishop Long, and if you have pondered um, his dilemma, I'll put it that way, uh, in light of his earlier very homophobic responses? Well, thank you for the question. For, for those not familiar with this story, I was a neighbor of Ms. Coretta Scott King. The King family and, and the Bond family lived next to each other, really a house apart. And her children and my children were playmates as little children 
as school children and still know each other today. And I was a big fan of hers and I was particularly proud of her forthright, outspoken support for gay rights and for same-sex marriage. And really thought this was a brave thing for her to do because, you know, if you look in the historical record, and I know this is true because somebody just written a book about this, there's no record of Dr. King expressing any real opinions about homosexuality. Did he like it? Did he not like it? Did he think it was okay? Not okay? We don't have any idea. But we know that she was a firm defender of justice for everyone. And we know that when she died, her family decided that her Dexter, that that Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta was too small to hold her funeral. And therefore, even though there are many other big churches in Atlanta, it should be held at New Birth, which the church pastored by Reverend Eddie Long. And Eddie Long um, and Dr. King's daughter, who is the co-assistant pastor of Eddie Long's church, had led an ugly anti-gay hate march through Atlanta some years ago. And when it came time to funeralize Mrs. King, I thought, well, I can't go to that. I can't participate in that, and so I didn't go. And I made it plain that I couldn't go because I thought that she would not be happy there. Uh, no, I haven't had to reflect on that one bit or, or think about it for another minute. I, I have to say I feel sorry for his family um, and hope he's able to come out of this in some way. Maybe coming out is what he really needs to do. Uh, but. It, you know, this is a, is a major problem afflicting the black church particularly because of all the people in the United States, black Americans increased in homophobia while every other group in the country, Hispanics, you name them, went down in homophobia. Black people went up in homophobia. We are becoming more and more homophobic by the years and I think it's all based it, it all stems from the church and from these church teachings. Um, you know, some of us are so guided by Leviticus. What is it? Do not wear, uh, you can't sleep with a, a man as thou sleeps with a woman. But you know, it also says in Leviticus, don't wear clothes of a different cloth. And here I am, I think it's a silk tie, <laughs> cotton shirt, wool suit. And the punishment for this is death. Hey! Come on. You know, you can't, I don't want to f dispute believers, well, so I better not say anything more. <laughs> but anyway, no, so I haven't had any thoughts about that at all. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, there is a program called my, the Government Speech to uh, uh, Restrict the, uh, there's a um, program called the Government's Ability to Compel and Restrict Speech, relevant to the uh, freedom movement, civil rights movements. Uh, what is your assessment of the uh, a pending uh, Ashcroft ruling before the Supreme Court and the relevancy of the Patriot Act and the one prior to that in relevance to civil disobedience and civil rights. Can they uh, prescribe uh, civil disobedience and can the Ashcroft ruling that's before the Supreme Court now prescribe freedom movements and civil, di civil disobedience and civil rights? Well, the answer is can they? Of course, the answer is yes, of course they can. But the answer is should they? then the answer is no, they should not. But of course, what you and I may think about what they should do is not what they're going to do. Could you clarify, I'm still not clear on what this Ashcroft ruling is. It's before the Supreme Court. Could you clarify that? I'm not sure if I could explain it as clearly as, 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 it would, as you would like, but there are many, many lawyers here who could stand up, <laughs> eat probably even some law students. No? Okay. Uh, <laughs> or some lawyer here who can explain to us the Ashcroft, because this is an important moment coming in our, our lives. Isn't there someone here? And relevant to, uh, like you said, you participate in a lot of civil dis disobedience. Yes. How does this correlate, this ruling? Yes, is there someone here who volunteered to come up and explain the Ashcroft case and what a decision one way or the other would mean to our civil rights and civil liberties? Surely in this room full of lawyers, law clerks, law professors, lawyers to be, people want to be lawyers, <laughs> but, and, and even a judge, even a judge here who could say. Isn't the abuse, the abuse of the material witness rule and whether or not he can be held personally liable, whether or not he gets qualified immunity for arresting people of Muslim extraction and holding them under the material
material witness rule when they weren't a material witness rule. And so that's, that's a question which will be decided by the court. And if they decide in General Ashcroft's favor, it will be a dark day for civil liberties in the United States. If they decide against General Ashcroft, then it will be a happy day for civil liberties. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Um, um, my name is Jude Hinsey Gaines. And Come up a little closer to the microphone. My name is Jude Hinsey Gaines, and I would like to ask why people created segregation, because there's no difference in people except their opinions and conditions and what they think. Well, you know, that's a very interesting question and a very deep question because there have been numerous, numerous scholars who, labor, who have labored over this question. Why did this system of separating people one from the other emerge? What was the rationale for it? Who, who thought of this? Who said this is a good idea? Why did they think it was a good idea? I think most people believe that this system was begun because one group of people felt superior to the other group and they needed to reinforce that superiority by, requ by requiring that the inferior group would always get second place. And so they divided the, the inferior group into separate housing, separate schools, separate almost everything, and made it more difficult for them to compete in life with the supposed inferior group. That's what most people believe, and I guess that's as good a reason as any can say. Okay. Yes. My name is James Pridgett. I'm a human being. Uh, your work was brought to my attention through History Channel program, but <clears throat> uh, on the Ku Klux Klan, I believe it was, but it was very inspirational. And I became uh, familiar with the, your projects and projects of colleagues and so on, and just the historical context in which you tried to improve people's lives. What I'm wondering about today is formal institutions for change uh, aside, is, do, you, do you feel optimistic that some sort of controversial, flashy civil disobedience would be helpful? in raising people's uh, consciousness in this country, given just the enthusiasm for which people are supporting, uh, you might call them retroactive belief systems and things which most people would think of as bad ideas. Um, so, so am I to understand, your question is, do I believe that aggressive civil disobedience would be an, an asset to improving the country and yes. improving the welfare of people? Yes, I do. I think um, Dr. King's exercise in leading protests showed us how successful this measure, this method can be, as have many others both before King and since King. So surely I do think so, that if we were able to develop disciplined practitioners in nonviolent civil disobedience, I think it'd do a great deal toward moving the needle forward and making us into a better place. I'm not sure if this will happen. I'm not sure if many people understand uh, about nonviolence. It's, it's uh, interesting to me that even in the days when I was in the nonviolent movement, uh, there, many, there were many people who themselves might participate in these demonstrations, but who, who, who disavowed the practice itself, um, either because they were fearful of being struck and thought they might not be able to control themselves and would have to strike back or for some other reason. But surely I think it would, it would be an asset to all of us if we could develop some disciplined nonviolent, a disciplined nonviolent movement in the United States. Thank yeah. you for existing. Yes, sir. Yes, everyone over here? The, um, yeah, no, go ahead. Being old enough to have gone through the, some of the civil rights movement of the 70s, 60s, it's a very different world out there. And what is your view of how we make some further progress um, in what seems to be almost a stalemate in our society. Well, if you look at this uh, last week's election, what, what's the difference between last week's election and the one we had two years before that? One major difference is that more people voted two years ago than voted this time. And among the people who did not vote were the people who voted in the majority two years ago, but who now were counted as non-voters and didn't show up on, on election day for one reason or another, we don't know why. Had those people shown up in sufficient numbers, then this election two, a week ago would have been very different than it is. So one thing we've got to do is accustom people that this is an occasion when you have to show up. You can't just say, hey, I did it once and, and that's good enough. And it's particularly telling among younger people, you younger people, younger people who 
didn't show up in sufficient numbers as they had in the previous two years. Had they done so, the outcome would have been very, very different. And the same is true, a little less true of, of racial minorities, but to some degree it's true of racial minorities. They showed up at slightly less numbers than they did two years ago. I've always thought that when I was president of the Atlanta NAACP many, many years ago, we used to have voter registration drives all the time not just in the months before elections, all the time. And we used to get card tables, and we'd set them up in front of grocery stores, and as people came up to the grocery stores, we'd say, are you registered to vote? And often they'd say no, and they'd say, would you mind registering now? And they'd say, okay, of course I would. I'm happy to have the opportunity. The NAACP doesn't do that. I don't know what the NAACP in Cleveland does. The NAACP in Atlanta doesn't do that anymore. And it only does it at all, if at all, when an election is pending because they believe that's the only time people are interested in voting. Of course it's not. People who are not registered are interested in voting anytime somebody says, aren't you registered? They're embarrassed about it. They want to do something about it. I just read in the paper that Donovan McNabb, you know who Donovan McNabb is, don't you? My wife's gonna hate me for this. She's a big sports fan, I don't care. <laughs> Donovan McNabb, how old is Donovan McNabb, you think? 34, 35 years old? He didn't vote till 2008. He didn't vote till 2008, come on, where's he been all the time? What was he waiting for? I can't believe that, that a man of his caliber, and he's an admirable figure, I think, big, didn't vote till 2008, and the others like him. Uh, anyway, so one thing we could do is, if, if we just had ongoing registration drives from now until the next election, two years from now, and if in the next election, two years from now, we aggressively knocked on doors and called on the telephone and grabbed people and made them turn out, I believe the election result will be very different. But we have to do those things. We can't wait for them to happen or hope they'll happen. We have to do them. Yes. Hi, my name is Cheyenne Chambers. I'm a senior here at Case, and I have a tough question for you. Um, how would you rate the, per the president's performance in terms of tackling the issue of race in America today? Oh, gee, how would I rate President Obama's performance, I guess, on an ABC scale? Um, Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sympathetic to his feeling that he doesn't want to be the black president. He, he is the black president, you know. But he doesn't want to be the black president. He doesn't want to be known as the black president. I understand why. He wants to be the president for everybody. Um, and so he's very cautious when talking about this subject, as when he jumped in, wrongly so, I think, to the case of uh, Henry Louis Gates in Boston, uh, that was some, something he should have stayed away from. Um, the Cambridge police were wrong from the start. Most people knew they were wrong from the start, and when he jumped into it, some of the opinion began to shift the other way. So I thought it was a mistake for him to jump into that. It wasn't a life-threatening mistake. It wasn't the worst thing he's ever done, but he shouldn't have done that. And um, I don't know how I would judge him. I guess on an ABC scale, I'd probably give him a B or something and hope he'd do better, but I'd be reluctant to say, here's what you need to do instead. Um, he gave a wonderful speech on race during the time the Jeremiah Wright controversy was bubbling along, and I thought that was well done and well put together, and probably better put together than anyone before him had ever done. Um, but um, I can't think just off the top of my head what he might do better than he's done in the past. If but don't, don't do something like that again. <laughs> If I could ask another question really sure. quickly. Um, you spoke about Clarence Thomas and his dissent in the uh, affirmative action cases dealing with the University of Michigan. Um, looking at Thomas's background, he grew up in the South in the middle of Jim Crow. How do you explain for his current philosophies on race? I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss to explain it. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't imagine someone growing up in, in similar circumstances with a similar background would have come out that same way. And why he did, I don't know. It's just a mystery to me. Um, Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Bond. Uh, you talked about affirmative action. And uh, it seems that in Northeastern Ohio, that's the only thing I can talk about because I don't know about the entire country, that there are hiring, firing uh, inequities in Northeastern Ohio. What can regular citizens do to address these things when they know that they're going on? Well, we, um, what can regular citizens do? 
we now have a Department of Justice that seems much more eager to address inequities of current law than has ever has been true over the last eight years. So that in the past when some act of discrimination occurred and it seemed to objective observers to be fairly blatant, in the past the Department of Justice tended to look away from this or to do little or nothing about it. Now I think that's no longer the case that under the direction of Eric Holder, we have a different set of people there, a different set, there's a different sheriff in town. And if you seek remedies at law, your chances of success in a case that you should succeed in has increased Im immeasurably. But I think what individual citizens have to do is just look around them and, and point out uh, where they see blatant acts of discrimination and insist that the proper authorities do something about it. Um, Anyway, uh, you just need to make as much noise about it as you possibly can and insist that the people responsible for fixing it, fix it. They know who they are, and you know who they are, and tell them they need to do something about it, or you'll know the reason why. All right, not only are there inequities in hiring and firing, of course, it's like once you get a job that maybe uh, minorities or women or blacks traditionally don't have, it's much harder to keep it because you're usually the first one bounced out no matter how well you perform. Uh, so you would say that um, having public forums or protests would be the way to address that as well? It's one of the ways. It's not the only ways, way, but it's one of the ways. Um, you know, the squeaky wheel does get the grease. Uh, and if you don't squeak, you're not going to get any grease. Uh, and your grease will go ungreased <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay? Yes. Good evening. Mr. Bonner, I appreciated your comments on affirmative action. Can you briefly elaborate on California's Proposition 209 and how that has adversely affected African Americans and other students of color, especially with a recent New York Times article that has been emailed throughout the country where they said that fourth grade African American boys are reading at a 12% 12, 12 proficient uh, rating and how that will affect us as uh, people of color in the future. Well, Proposition 209, which passed several years ago at a vote of the people of, of California, essentially eliminated affirmative action in the state of California. And it meant that universities and public parties that used to practice affirmative action could no longer do so. And the resu result you could see almost immediately if you looked at the participation of racial minorities in the student bodies of California's flagship universities, you just see them go down, uh, measurably go down. And um, they haven't come back up anymore, and they're not likely to come back up until there's been some redressing uh, of this issue, and that doesn't look too uh, likely right now. So it was just a devastating blow to equity and fairness in California, and it's had a terrible, terrible, terrible effect. And again, unless Californians mobilize themselves somehow and reverse this trend, um, it, it will continue to get worse. And of course, you see what happened with the marijuana initiative, something that you, all fair-minded, smart people thought should have just passed e easily. I certainly did, uh, was defeated. But Californians had a chance to eliminate this warehousing of black people in the prisons because of these minor, minor drug offenses for which black people are arrested all of the time, white people almost never, and they passed it by. Uh, so that was a tragedy too. Not, connect, not quite connected to what you're talking about. Do you see other states passing similar legislation like Proposition 209? Other states have done so. Uh, the state of Washington did so. Um, and I'm sure others who's, who don't come to mind have done so too. So uh, it's not surprising that they did or that others will if they haven't, they haven't thought of it so far. And if the Republicans want to drive their people to the polls, then they'll do it too, because that's why they do these things. They don't care anything about affirmative action. They're not for it or against it. They want to get people to come to the polls, and so they say, should two men marry? No, my God, not two men, come on. So they'll put this on the ballot, and their, their, their supporters will turn out in large, large numbers. That's what this is all about. It has nothing to do with the issue. All right, thank you. Yes, Mr. Bond, my name is James Page, and. Uh, I'm just a community activist. I wanted to know some of your thoughts about the black farmers, which came to light more a reference to uh, Shirley Sherrod's case. And in October, I understand that uh, they uh, 
uh, was the ninth time that they were won the settlement to get paid. And I wanted to know if you think they may ever get any financial redress, even though they've won, but it's in the legislature. They have won, but members of the Senate, Republican members of the Senate, have blocked this settlement. So these farmers, um, and Hispanic farmers too, not just black farmers, these farmers who won in court, won their justice, ha are having their justice denied them because Republican members of the Senate are standing in the way. And it's just outrageous. And you'd hope, maybe against hope, that in this lame duck session, that somebody will be able to do so somebody, you'd hope some Republican, uh, Senator, what's a Republican senator from Ohio? Voinovich, Voinovich, he's got nothing to lose. Why wouldn't he do this? Why wouldn't he do this? This is a decent thing to do, the right thing to do. And maybe he's not the one standing in the way. It's somebody else, but he ought to help the Democrats do it. Uh, and if he did, he could help make a big difference and people would be forever grateful. And farmers all over the country would be saying, Voinovich, Voinovich, Voinovich. Hey. <laughs> be a great day for him. Thank you, Mr. Bond, for being here. My name is Kimberly Brown. I'm a 2L here at the law school. And I'd I guess one of the things that strikes me looking at the civil rights movement and looking um, in my own experience, I'm from Greenville, South Carolina, born and raised, and then moved to New York for undergrad and then here to Ohio now. And I guess what strikes me about my generation is a general apathy. Um, and it crosses all barriers. And so I guess what I'm wondering from you is what, what advice do you have for young people, especially people who are mo moving out of the professional world into looking to make social change? How, how can we best go about doing that? Well, I think you just have to figure out what, where do you fit? What's your area? What's your, what part of this struggle for justice do you want to be in? And what do you want to do in it? And then you have to jump into it and do it. You know, this summer in April, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We sent out invitations and we expected 300 people to come. Over a thousand people came. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life. And I thought to myself, this is 1960 when young people, black young people particularly, were active in social protest. And they have not been active since then. They've not lifted their hands, lifted their feet, They've not done anything of my, no my knowledge since then. Why, I don't know. What made them think it was okay to do it then but not okay to do it now, so I don't know. But I think you have to say, I'm gonna do this and, and just go ahead and do it and then talk to your fellows and say, don't you feel ignorant that you're not doing this too? And maybe they won't, maybe they'll get mad at you, but you can take it because you're gonna be a lawyer and you have to be tough. We'll get this one, one more, two more here and then we're through. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, my question to you is, uh, what do you think about the Department of Justice, the 2003 Department of Justice guidance for federal law enforcement that allows them to profile based on race and religion in the national security and border context? And why do you think the American people are so silent uh, when we now have FBI, DOJ guidance in 2008 that rolls back all the protections given during the COINTELPRO era and has now reconstituted the FBI as a domestic intelligence agency and directed all of its power at the American Muslim community. Why is the country so silent about the shredding of those civil I liberties? I think people are, are silent about shredding their, these civil liberties protections is because either they don't know, and many of them I think don't know, or even more scary, they don't care. If they don't know, you can perhaps understand. If they know and don't care, it's frightening. It's our job, your job, my job, everyone's job to alert them to this wrong and make it sufficient noise so that they do begin concerned. They do begin wondering about it, do begin thinking that they can do and know they should do something about it. Uh, and if you make enough noise, they'll do something about it. I'm sure, yes sir. Mr. Bond, it was just an absolute honor to hear you speak today. Um, my name is Joshua Hill. I am an active member of the Youth Council of the Cleveland branch of the NAACP. Um, Wait, they, and tell, they tell us we don't have any young people. <laughs> <laughs> and with my generation, I feel that the times are 
going backwards. And it seems as if 30 to 40 years ago, people of our age and our generation would kill for schooling in a theoretical sense. But it seems as if it's reversed and it seems like violence is the is the more character, and it seems like they were killed before school. So it seems like the generations are getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And as times evolve, do you feel that it would get better, or do you feel that it'll get worse, especially for the African American race? I am an optimistic person. I always believe things are going to get better, and I think they will get better if sufficient numbers of people put their shoulders to the wheel and do what they can. Why is there such a high murder rate among black young people? Is one of the reasons why that they can get a gun as easily as they can buy a pack of cigarettes? Can't that be one of the reasons? Is there some reason why we let the National Rival Association prevent us from getting rid of getting effective controls on guns? Of course, that's the reason. Uh, but we have to begin to do something about it. And just as an answer to the last question, we have to know about it, we have to worry about it, and we have to act about it. I'm so happy to see a young member of the NAACP. I know you're not the only one. There are many others like you. But I, I'm, turn around so that people can see you. <laughs> and and don't, don't, don't ever let anybody say, tell you the NAACP has no young people in it. We have hundreds of thousands of young people like this young man here. And with your help, we could have hundreds of thousands more. Thank you all very much. We have been privileged this evening to hear a voice that resonated across this country for half a century, and we now understand why. This is a man who has led us in directions that we need to go, and we understand why he is still a voice to which people, we hope, will listen. Now let's adjourn to the reception outside. Thank you all for attending.